Welcome to a brief history of MUSC. Over the next 40 or so minutes, I will highlight periods and events in MUSC history that I believe were some of the most crucial in shaping the institution into what it is today. As you listen, please keep two points in mind. First, I am only covering a small fraction of MUSC's history. With nearly 200 years under its belt, it would be impossible to cover everything. Even the topics that I'm covering today could be their own individual 40-minute presentations. And second, rather than presenting this information chronologically, I've organized it by topic so that I may delve a little deeper into why the events I discuss are critical chapters in MUSC's story. The specific topics I'll be covering today include the origins of the Medical Society of South Carolina and the establishment of the Medical College of South Carolina, a general overview of the development of MUSC's academic programs and curriculum, how and why we became a state institution, the university's physical expansion in Charleston and across the state, some bumps in the road that forced the institution to change, and the impact of diversity and inclusion in strengthening the institution. What was healthcare like in South Carolina's early days? The first physician of European ancestry in the state is believed to have been a ship's surgeon that landed in Charleston in 1666. Early doctors treated epidemics of malaria, smallpox, yellow fever, and dysentery. In 1707, the first quarantine station, or pest house, was built on Sullivan's Island, and the first attempt at a hospital in the state was sponsored by St. Philip's Parish in Charleston in 1738. In the early 18th century, Edinburgh, Scotland was the most important center of medical education, and many of our early physicians attended the University of Edinburgh. By the end of the 18th century, however, several South Carolina physicians decided it was time to form their own society focused on bettering medicine in the state. The Medical Society of South Carolina was founded on Christmas Eve, 1789, in Charleston by a small group of private physicians to, quote, improve the science of medicine, promoting liberality in the profession, and harmony amongst the practitioners in this city. Members were predominantly Charleston physicians, however, it was open to physicians throughout the state. In its early years, the Medical Society quickly became a leader in medical and public health issues. In 1800, the Society established the Shiraz Dispensary, which provided much-needed medicine to the sick and indigent. In 1805, it formed the Board of Health and Vital Statistics. The Society established a medical library in 1791 to help physicians keep abreast of current literature. It operated a botanic garden from 1805 to 1815, was granted the right to approve licenses for the practice of medicine by the state legislature in 1817, and the Medical Society established the Medical College of South Carolina. Why did the Medical Society decide to establish a medical school in South Carolina? Members of the Medical Society were inspired to pursue the establishment of a medical school in Charleston by Dr. Thomas Cooper. In 1821, Dr. Cooper, president of the South Carolina College in Columbia and a former professor of chemistry at the University of Pennsylvania, proposed to the State Medical Examining Board that a medical college be established and be divided between Columbia and Charleston. Dr. Cooper had long been interested in medical education and had written the book, A Discourse on the Connection Between Chemistry and Medicine, in which he pointed out the need for longer and broader courses of medical study. The state population was growing, and there was an interest in providing the expanding population with physicians trained in-state. Another reason for establishing a medical school in South Carolina was the fact that travel of any distance was slow and difficult and not cheap. Existing medical schools in the early 1800s were not easily accessible to those living in the South. Choices were limited. The options were medical school in Europe, the University of Edinburgh in Scotland, for example, or one of the medical schools clustered in the northeastern United States. Finally, I believe the Medical College of South Carolina was established to keep outside influences at bay, to control how medicine was taught. I believe the founders wanted to prevent liberal outside influences, especially the anti-slavery movement, from affecting education and, in particular, the use of enslaved bodies in anatomy classes. The first medical school proposal was submitted to the state legislature on November 25, 1822. It was rejected, however, because it included requests for state financial support for salaries, facilities, and equipment. 
On February 1, 1823, Dr. Samuel Henry Dixon gave an address before the Medical Society of South Carolina on the establishment of a medical school in Charleston, independent of state funding, and submitted a resolution that a committee be appointed to prepare a report on establishing the medical college. The committee, in its April 1, 1823 presentation to the Medical Society, reported that it had communicated with the trustees of the Charleston College about opening the medical school through its charter, but they were refused. In this same report, the committee argued that, quote, all obstacles might be surmounted if the power to confer diplomas was obtained. The committee went on to prepare a petition to the state legislature asking for the power to grant diplomas. This petition was favorably received and an act was passed by the legislature at its next session. On December 20, 1823, the South Carolina General Assembly granted the request of the Medical Society for a charter to establish the Medical College of South Carolina in Charleston, making it the 10th medical school in the United States. While the South Carolina General Assembly granted the school a charter, it did not provide funding for the enterprise. The faculty of the school bore the entire expense for the operation of the college. Lecturers sold tickets, such as the ones shown here, to their classes, which generated the only income for the faculty. When a student took a class, the faculty redeemed these tickets with the Medical Society for payment. In November 1824, the school opened with a faculty of seven Charleston physicians and five students. Medical education at the time consisted of four months of study in each of two consecutive years, with the second year being a repetition of the first year. The first five students graduated on April 4, 1825, after only a year, because each candidate had had at least one year of medical education elsewhere. In the early years, requirements for graduation from the college were relatively easy when compared to today's standards. In addition to completing two full courses of lectures in anatomy, surgery, the Institutes and Practice of Medicine, Chemistry, Obstetrics, and Materia Medica, candidates had to be of good moral character, of or above 21 years of age, have studied medicine three years with some respectable practitioner, presented to the faculty a thesis or dissertation, and undergone an examination of the branches of study taught in the college. One of the unfortunate early selling points of the college was its access to bodies for anatomy class. According to the annual announcement of the trustees and faculty of the Medical College of the State of South Carolina for the session of 1840-41, to 41, quote, Charleston possesses peculiar advantages for the prosecution of practical anatomy. Subjects for dissection are obtained in ample number, chiefly from the black population, and at far less expense, it is believed, than any other institution in the country. Despite being propri proprietary rather than state-supported, the college flourished. Within eight years of its founding, it had a student body of 109 with 35 graduates. By 1856, the college's first teaching hospital, Roper, was in regular use. After 50 plus years focused on educating doctors, the medical college began to expand into other areas of healthcare education. As early as 1824, the medical college offered lectures on topics of Materia Medica, Botany and Natural History, and Chemistry and Practical Pharmacy pharmacy courses which were also foundation courses for the study of medicine. During the next four decades, a handful of diplomas in pharmacy were awarded by the medical college. However, it wasn't until 1874 that the medical college conferred its first official degree of pharmacy. In 1881, by faculty resolution, the medical college created a department of pharmacy that was the first of its kind in the Deep South. The first degree seeking students were admitted in 1882 However, the program was discontinued after two years. After some reorganization, the school resumed on a permanent basis in 1894, offering the degree of graduate in pharmacy. The College of Nursing had its origin in 1882 when the City Council of Charleston approved a request by the City Hospital to establish a training school for nurses. The school was opened in 1883 and continued operating at the City Hospital until it was destroyed by an earthquake in 1886. The school was reestablished as the Charleston Training School in 1895. A two-year program of instruction was offered, with some lectures given by the Medical College faculty. 
Between 1904 and 1916, Roper Hospital administered the nursing program until the Board of Commissioners of the Roper Hospital proposed incorporating the training school with the medical college. In 1919, the Roper Training School for Nurses became the School of Nursing of the Medical College of the State of South Carolina and expanded to a three-year diploma program. The College of Graduate Studies began as a graduate committee of the School of Medicine in 1949 with programs in anatomy, chemistry, pathology, pharmacology, and physiology. A program in microbiology was added and the first students were admitted in 1950. The School of Graduate Studies was formally organized as the fourth branch of the Medical College in 1965. The creation of the Graduate Studies program played a pivotal role in the Medical College of South Carolina's eventual move to university status and its development into a strong biomedical research institution. In 1952, the South Carolina Dental Association recommended that a school of dentistry be established as a unit of the Medical College of South Carolina. The state legislature authorized the development of the School of Dental Medicine the following year, but it was not until 1964 that the legislature provided the funds to implement the 1953 authorization. The school received 210 applications for its inaugural class and ultimately selected 24 students, all South Carolinians. The first class enrolled in the dental school in the fall of 1967 and 21 of the 24 matriculants were graduated with DMD degrees in June 1971. Established in 1966, the College of Health Professions was formally organized from the Medical College's Division of Technical Training to prepare allied health professionals for careers in the growing healthcare industry. In 1968, the new school awarded its first Bachelor of Science degrees to one cytotechnologist and four medical technologists. Established around the fields of medical technology, radiologic technology, cytotechnology, inhalation therapy, and a nurse anesthetist program, the curriculum expanded to, to offer over 20 different training options in the paramedical field. One of the most significant events in MUSC history was the state takeover. At the start of the 20th century, there was growing concern nationally about the number of medical schools, referred to as diploma mills, which were, which were churning out doctors after little or inadequate instruction. In February 1909, Abraham Flexner, working for the Carnegie Foundation and the American Medical Association, visited Charleston and evaluated the medical college as part of his national tour of medical schools. In his 1910 report, his assessment of the medical college was brief and lackluster. He criticized the school for its poor equipment, poor physical facilities, lack of full-time professors, and lack of money. He recommended that all medical education in the Southeast be focused at a total of six locations, including Atlanta. Charleston did not make the cut. In 1913, the medical college successfully petitioned the state legislature to transfer ownership of the school to the state. Medical College Dean, Dr. Robert Wilson, is credited with saving the school from closure in the wake of Flexner's report. Shortly after the publication of the report in 1910, Wilson brokered a deal with the South Carolina governor to turn the college over to the state, which would entitle it to state appropriations. In 1913, the Medical College of the State of South Carolina became, in fact, what it had been in name, an official state institution. This brought public funding and allowed teaching and service roles to expand steadily. As its academic programs developed and grew to include new colleges and the medical college became a state institution, it began to expand its footprint on the Charleston Peninsula and influence the development of the region. The first building of the Medical College of South Carolina was erected in 1826 at the corner of Queen and Back, now Franklin, Streets. The building boasted a dissecting room, medical museum, library, lecture halls, and proximity to the city's hospitals. The Medical Society opened Roper Hospital in 1856, and it served as the teaching hospital until 1955, when the Medical College opened its own hospital. The Medical College remained on Queen Street for 88 years until 1914, when as part of the deal to transfer the Medical College to state management, the South Carolina Legislature appropriated $100,000 to the school with the provision that the local population raised the money for a new building to replace the one on Queen Street. This new building was built in 1914 on a site donated by the city of Charleston. The Hollings Cancer Center at the corner of Jonathan Lucas and Calhoun Streets 
now occupies this land. For the first two decades after the transfer to the state, though, funding and space continued to be problems. There are two examples of MUSC's physical expansion that I believe set the stage for its dramatic growth. The first is the construction of the 1955 Medical College Hospital on Dowdy Street. Since 1856, Roper Hospital had served as the primary teaching hospital for the college. Medical College Dean Kenneth Lynch realized that in order to advance, the college had to have a teaching hospital under its own authority, and as early as 1944 began planning for the new hospital. In 1955, the Medical College Hospital was opened, having been built with funds allocated from the federal government. It represented the first in a long line of facilities expansions which would greatly enlarge the campus footprint and building capacity. The second event that set the stage for the institution's extensive growth was the Medical College of South Carolina's purchase of the 11-acre former site of the Porter Military Academy. The acquisition of this property provided MUSC with land on which to build the Basic Science College of Dental Medicine building, the Colbert Education Center and Library, and several other buildings constructed within the past 20 years. Three of the Porter Military Academy's original buildings remain on campus, including the Waring Historical Library, which is circled in the bottom image. Construction has exploded over the past 20 years, particularly on the Charleston Peninsula. The resulting lack of space has led MUSC to advancements in telehealth and distance learning opportunities. In addition to numerous health service locations in the Tri-County area, MUSC has locations in Greenville, Rock Hill, Columbia, Florence, Myrtle Beach, and Beaufort, to name a few. With periods of immense growth also came times of hardship and strife. Several times over the past 198 years, events and situations forced MUSC to reevaluate its mission and make changes in order to survive. I will now introduce you to a few bumps in the road that greatly influenced MUSC's development. The first big bump is what I call the Great Schism of 1832 to 1839. Let me start by saying that due to time constraints, I am unable to delve deeply into the relationship between the medical society and the medical college faculty that existed prior to the schism. According to founding medical college faculty member, Dr. Samuel Henry Dixon, the medical society did not provide any substantial support for the medical college in its early years. The entire operation had been paid for by the faculty and there was jealousy on the part of medical society members over the success of the college. On the other hand, the medical society believed that the school wouldn't have existed without its support, and it had been instrumental in the school's success. Suffice it to say, the relationship was complicated. The following short description is extremely general, but if you'd like more information, please contact me. In 1832, a fissure between the faculty and the medical society erupted over the appointment of a new faculty member. Unhappy with the selection process for replacing a colleague, the entire faculty resigned and established its own institution, named the Medical College of the State of South Carolina. The medical society hired a replacement faculty, largely from the north, and continued to operate in the building on Queen Street. The new college purchased the old Charleston Theater building at the corner of New and Broad Streets, and the two schools operated in competition for nearly six years, just blocks from each other. Ultimately, the new college, with the original faculty, was more successful, and after years of competition, the two merged back together under the name Medical College of the State of South Carolina in 1839. Again, that was a very brief synopsis that doesn't really do the topic justice. The next big bump in the road was the Civil War. The medical college suspended classes after the March 1861 graduation as its faculty and students rushed off to serve in the war. The arrival of the Civil War forced the medical profession in Charleston and elsewhere to innovate and improve practices, particularly in the area of trauma management. Hundreds of medical college alumni, faculty, and students served in the Confederate Medical Department. Among them was class of 1834 alumnus Samuel Preston Moore, who served as the Surgeon General of the Confederacy. Moore commissioned fellow Medical College alumni to write two Bibles of Confederate military medicine. Julian John Chisholm, class of 1850, wrote his Manual of Military Surgery, and F. Pair Porche, class of 1847, wrote his Resources of the Southern Fields and Forests. 
After an interval of nearly five years, the college resumed classes despite some major challenges, its building, equipment, and specimens having been destroyed. All but one member of the faculty returned, and by November 1865, classes had resumed. In March of 1866, the college graduated its first post-war class. Additionally, disease and natural disasters have shaped MUSC. During the 1886 earthquake, the medical college facilities were so badly damaged that they couldn't be used for more than a year. Classes were moved to new wooden structures and to the former U.S. Marine Hospital around the corner from the college on Franklin Street, which had been abandoned after the Civil War because of damage. Roper Hospital was also forced to close, which limited student access to training opportunities for a period of time. In January 1887, the state legislature appropriated $5,000 for the school's restoration, and additional funds were raised by public subscription. In the spring of 1887, the repairs were completed and the school re returned to its old home. Due to the very real danger posed by diseases, particular, particularly yellow fever, the academic year ran November to April to avoid times of the year in which the fever was most prevalent in the city. According to the annual bulletin of 1840-1841, because of outbreaks of cholera and yellow fever in Charleston between 1834 and 1839, the number of enrolled students decreased. Many chose to go elsewhere. Since its founding in 1670, Charleston and the Low Country have been battered by numerous hurricanes. One of the deadliest storms to hit the South Carolina coast is known as the Great Storm of 1893, which made landfall along the southern coast with little or no warning. A tremendous storm surge and high winds were responsible for more than 2,000 deaths. However, it was Hurricane Hugo, the Category 4 storm, that most tested the medical university's resiliency. On the night of September 21st and into the early morning hours of September 22nd, 1989, Hurricane Hugo battered the Charleston area with hours of heavy rains and 140 mile per hour winds. Hundreds of faculty and staff remained on campus during the storm to monitor patients, assist students and families, and ensure building safety. When the college reopened after the Civil War, enrollment was low and continued to decline until 1872, when there were only two graduates of the college. That same year, when students were unable to find money to attend medical school, all fees were suspended and faculty and trustees assumed these financial obligations. Times were so hard that the college offered free tuition to students from 1872 to 1876. By 1885 to 1886, enrollment had increased to 73 students, with 18 graduating in the spring of 1886. Between the time of the earthquake and the start of classes in October 1886, the number of students at the medical college dropped to 55 students. However, despite this lower enrollment, the number of students who graduated in 1887 was the same as in 1886, that is, 18. Although the number of students enrolled at the medical college rose to 62 in October 1887, enrollment was depressed for many years. The 1888-1889 circular acknowledged that many South Carolina students had left the state after the earthquake to seek medical education elsewhere. As I discussed earlier, it was the publication of the Flexner Report in 1910 which pushed the medical college to make dramatic changes in order to survive. By becoming a state institution, the college was fairly free from its financial struggles for several decades and could focus on improving academics and expanding. The final topic that I will be covering is diversity and inclusion. Through charts and graphs, I will show the increased diversity of MUSC's faculty and student body and the positive impacts of women and minorities to the institution. At the time of the opening of the Medical College of South Carolina in 1824, nine medical schools had already been established in the United States. And like the others, the Medical College did not admit women as students. Women instead were given the opportunity to study to become nurses. Why did the Medical College decide to open its doors to women? Possibly because of financial reasons. At the May 31, 1894 faculty meeting, the treasurer had reported that of the $1,275 owed by students, only $300 had been collected. With the addition of women, the college would have enough money to continue running. 
After much faculty debate, a decision was made to admit women, and an announcement seen here was printed in the Medical College Dean's Report of March 14, 1895. It was then published for the first time in the school's supplement to the 1894-1895 annual announcement. While women could technically apply for medical school, the first women didn't matriculate until 1898. By 1900, 2,936 male students had graduated with medical or pharmacy degrees, while zero women did. Fun fact, the first woman to apply and be rejected by the medical college was Elizabeth Blackwell in 1846. She went on to attend Geneva College and earned her medical degree in 1849, becoming the first American woman to earn such a degree. The first two women were admitted to the College of Medicine in 1898. Love Rosa Hirschman Gant and Emily Melanie Viette Runlet both graduated in 1901 and went on to pursue successful careers. Dr. Gant as a public health physician in Spartanburg, South Carolina, and Dr. Runlet in private practice and on the faculty of Seton Hall Medical School in New Jersey. The historical record for the early years of the College of Pharmacy is spotty, so unfortunately not much is known about Heavy Butler or Jane Colson, the, the first pharmacy women graduates. Between 1901 and 1912, out of 505 total graduates, only 11 women graduated. While the school's annual catalogs from 1895 to 1909 contained the statement that, quote, women are admitted on the same terms as men, a few years after the first two women graduated, the presence of women students was deemed undesirable, and the sentence was omitted from the annual catalog beginning in 1910. The historical records referenced for this talk differ on when privileges for women were withdrawn. In one source, the 1964 memoir of Dr. Portia McKnight Lubchenco, she mentions applying to the medical college in Charleston in 1907 and being told that it was not accepting women, even though the statement about admitting women was still published in the annual catalog. So what happened? I'm not exactly sure. An excerpt from A History of the Medical College written for its centennial in 1924 mentions this change but doesn't really provide any details. Quote, Two more important events remain to be recorded. In November 1921, the Board of Trustees decided to give young women desiring them to study medicine equal opportunities to those enjoyed by young men. This was not an entirely new departure, women having been admitted some years previously for a short period, but it was then deemed undesirable and the privilege was withdrawn. Since 1916, 13 young women have matriculated in the School of Medicine, and the trustees and faculty have no occasion to regret their action in thus broadening the educational field for women of the state. There are no administrative records from that time discussing why women were suddenly deemed undesirable. However, annual reports from that period may give some clues as to why the faculty and board decided to once again admit women. Medical schools across the nation were beginning to adopt more advanced admission requirements. South Carolina's poor education system impacted the number of qualified applicants, so to remain in business, the college decided to open to women, thus bringing in more money. Women were readmitted in 1917, and the Board of Trustees went on to give women equal privileges as men in 1921. Though they were admitted, there continued to be an unwritten policy of not accepting women applicants in the College of Medicine. Between 1923 and 1948, the average number of women graduates was a little better than one a year, ranging in any given year from zero to three. The best year was 1949, when there were a whopping nine women graduates. It wasn't until 1975 that the number of women graduates in the College of Medicine reached double digits. Even then, that was ten students. As this chart shows, since 1982, the number of women students has steadily outpaced the number of men. The United States in the 1950s and 1960s was undergoing a transformation. Social movements and changes were occurring that influenced politics, which led to two factors that were responsible for the increase in the number of women students and faculty. The first is the Civil Rights Act of 1964, which ended segregation in public places and banned employment discrimination on the basis of race, color, religion, sex, or national origin. And the second is the Title IX of the Education Amendments Act of 1972, 
a federal law that prohibits discrimination on the basis of sex in any federally funded education program or activity. These acts gave women the legal power to demand inclusion. Even as the medical college made enormous strides in education, research, and patient care, it was still very much a Southern institution with a legacy of racial discrimination. Four years after assuming the MUSC presidency, Dr. William McCord presided over the 1969 hospital worker strike, which started on March 20th, when 12 African-American non-professional hospital workers were fired. This action triggered a strike of non-professional hospital workers at the Medical College Hospital and the Charleston County Hospital. During the course of the strike, over 400 hospital workers went on strike or marched against worker conditions. The strike drew Reverend Ralph Abernathy of the Southern Leadership Conference, Coretta Scott King, widow of Dr. Martin Luther King Jr., Andrew Young, and others in the National Civil Rights Movement to Charleston in a show of solidarity. A nighttime curfew was declared and the National Guard patrolled the streets. The strike was settled on June 27th, when the university rehired the workers who were fired as a result of the strike and put in place grievance policies. While the entry of women into the male-dominated field of medicine occurred in the late 19th century, the admittance of African Americans took much longer. Beyond the walls of the medical college campus, however, healthcare training of African Americans was moving forward. In 1897, local African American physicians established the Hospital and Training School for Nurses so that they could treat Charleston's black population and where African American nurses would be trained to care for its patients. The first African American student to apply and be accepted to the College of Medicine was a woman named Sarah Prelo. She was accepted in 1965, however, however, she did not finish her degree here. She went on to dental school in Pennsylvania. As with the early women graduates, there is little historical documentation for these pioneering African-American individuals, even though they graduated less than 50 years ago. This is the first of several slides depicting racial diversity in the student population between the years 1985 and 2019. The bottom line on this chart shows the number of minority students to graduate each year since 1985, while the top line depicts the total number of graduates. Based on the statistics I obtained from enrollment management, we see that the number of minority graduates has slowly increased over the past 35 years. However, it's never surpassed 200 graduates in a year. Since 1985, 3,325 minorities have graduated out of a total of 26,830. This pie chart depicts the general self-identification of graduates between 1985 and 2019. Two of the options available as race are international and undeclared. Because they are listed under race in MUSC system, I chose to include those figures. As you can see, minorities represent 12.4% of the total number of graduates. Whites represent 81.6% of the total number of graduates. International represents 1.92%. Undeclared represents 4.09% of total graduates, or combined, 18.2% identify as a race other than white. This chart is a more specific breakdown of the racial self-identification of graduates from all six colleges for the years 1985 to 2019. The numbers in parentheses after each race is the number of graduates that identify for that race. Two pie charts back, I mentioned that between 1985 and 2019, MUSC graduated 26,830 students, and the total number of minority graduates, 3,325, accounts for 12.4% of the university's graduates. While MUSC has made strides in diversity and inclusion, there is still much work to be done if we are to reflect the racial diversity of South Carolina's population. I looked at the most recent data on South Carolina's racial demographics. As of July 1, 2019, whites make up 68.6 percent of the state's population, black African American 27 percent, American Indian Alaska Native 0.5 percent, Asian 1.8 percent, Native Hawaiian and other Pacific Islander 0.1 percent, two or more races 2 percent, and Hispanics or Latinos account for 6 percent of the South Carolina population. 
Here are the exact numbers of minority students that graduated in each college between 1985 and 2019. Please note that it does not include numbers for those whose race is undeclared, left blank, or those who identified it as international. Since 1985, the number of minority women has always exceeded the number of male minorities. In the past decade, the number of women has often been three times the number of men. Now let's look at diversity and inclusion amongst MUSC faculty. For this presentation, I'm only looking at the current fiscal year. Further research needs to be conducted into earlier years, and I hope to have that completed by the next time I give this talk. Based on the data I obtained from MUSC's faculty database, the combined total number of faculty from the six colleges and the academic affairs faculty is 2,219. Men make up 1,174 faculty and women 1,058. Medicine, pharmacy, and dental medicine faculty are majority male, while health professions, nursing, and academic affairs are majority women. In the first 100 years of its existence, the College of Medicine did not have any women on faculty. It wasn't until 1927 that the first woman was hired as a lecturer in the college. Dr. Sylvia Allen and a few other women were hired at lower ranks, and some even volunteered their time for part-time teaching positions. This changed after World War II. Post-World War II was a period of rapid growth for the medical college. The dean during that time, Kenneth Lynch, oversaw a significant expansion of the medical center. In a report, Dean Lynch wrote that the year 1947 saw a readjustment by faculty, staff, and students to a, quote, normal schedule and outlook, but products of World War II produced difficulties that would result in unforeseen issues. Lin Lynch continued, quote, among these are mounting costs of running a medical school, scarcity of well-qualified medical teaching personnel, a surplus of applicants for the study of medicine and pharmacy, and faculty demand for increased salaries. This increase in students was a result of the passage of the GI Bill in 1944, which helped veterans pay for college, graduate school, and other training programs. Due to the enlarged student body, the medical college found it necessary to hire additional qualified faculty. As Dean Lynch noted, there was a scarcity of well-qualified medical teaching personnel, and to meet the demand, more women were hired. Here are a few more notable women faculty. Throughout most of MUSC's history, the accomplishments of men have been well documented and preserved, while women's history and that of minorities has not received the same attention. The Waring Library's records relating to women and minorities is sorely lacking. With the upcoming bicentennial in 2024, though, the Waring is actively seeking collections of underrepresented populations so that MUSC's history will be more complete. As with the student population, the number of minority faculty is well below the number of majority white faculty. Again, this is something that MUSC has improved upon over the years, however, it has much more to do to make significant changes. Here is a look at the various names the medical college has used over the past almost 200 years. The Medical College of South Carolina, established in 1824, and in 1832, it split into two, the Medical College of South Carolina and Medical College of the State of South Carolina. They merged again in 1839 and became the Medical College of the State of South Carolina. In 1952, the name was changed back to the Medical College of South Carolina. And in 1969, the name was changed to its final name, Medical University of South Carolina. I'm out of time and only managed to cover a small portion of MUSC's history, so I wanted to quickly address the future. After nearly 200 years educating doctors, nurses, dentists, pharmacists, researchers, and health professionals, MUSC will continue to provide high quality graduates and provide the best health care to the citizens of South Carolina and beyond. The institution will continue making technological and therapeutic advances that will help us to live longer and healthier lives. To expand into more rural areas of the state and provide quality health care to those who have traditionally had to travel great distances for basic care. MUSC will continue working towards greater diversity of its faculty, staff, and student body, and continue working to ensure equity and inclusion of all. Finally, the institution will continue educating students using the best tools and people available. 
At the beginning of my presentation, I set a goal of covering the topics that I think had the bi biggest impact in the development of MUSC. I hope I successfully met my goals and that you leave this talk with a better understanding of